Hello, um, I'm Vanessa Moore. I'm the Project Engagement Officer on the Heritage Alliance's new Rebuilding Heritage Project. I'm delighted to welcome you today to this webinar as part of the Heritage Digital Project, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under the Digital Skills for Heritage Initiative. The subject of today's webinar is copyright and suppliers. Our speaker today is Naomi Korn of Naomi Korn Associates, and we'll be looking at how you can make sure that you get the rights you need when you're creating new digital content. Um, before we get started though, just a bit of digital housekeeping. So our session today is going to be an hour long. We're going to have 45 minutes of presentation, followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers at the end. Um, as audience members, your cameras and your microphones will be off for the duration of the whole session, but there are some opportunities for you to interact with us. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there are a number of options. Uh, firstly, you've got the chat option. So this is where you can um, say hello, interact with your fellow attendees. And also this is where you can let us know about any technical issues that you might have during the session. Uh, the Naomi Corn team are on hand just to sort any of those out for you. Next, you've got the Q&A box. So this is where you can put your questions for Naomi to answer at the end of the session. Um, but we are gonna be covering a huge amount of content in the session itself. So what I'd like to ask is if you could just hold off until we get nearer to the end of the presentation. Um, so if you hold off on your questions, that'll make it easier to work for us to manage the Q&A so that we can make sure um, that the questions haven't already been answered as part of the presentation. Uh, we're also going to be using polls during the session. So these are opportunities for you to answer questions by voting. Naomi will let you know when those opportunities arise and how you can vote. Um, we've also got live captioning, uh, so you can turn this on using the menu at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, this session is being recorded so that it can be shared on the Heritage Digital website afterwards. Um, the presentation and the Q&A will be recorded, but anything you share in the chat box or the Q&A box um, will not be shared as part of the recording. Now, uh, very quickly for those of you who aren't already familiar with the Heritage Digital programme, um, Heritage Digital is a project that brings together heritage and digital. Uh, we've got four partners on the project with a wealth of experience in both areas and who are coming together to share their knowledge with the sector. The project is led by the Heritage Alliance and we're working with Naomi Corn Associates, with Media Trust and with Charity Digital to produce a program of completely free digital skills training sessions. And these will be running um, from now until July 2021. It's online, it's completely free, um, it's open to staff, volunteers, trustees and freelancers and anyone associated with heritage organisations across the UK. Uh, just to let you know about the things we've done already, um, we've already run webinars on the topics of growing and engaging audiences online and getting started with data and we've produced three downloadable guides. Um, this, uh, this webinar will be added to the website and we'll also have a further guide that will coming, be coming out on this topic next month. Um, additionally, we've just announced um, we're running a virtual day event, which is gonna be on the 1st of October. Uh, this event uh, is called Heritage Digital Now, putting the digital into your strategy. So on this virtual day, you'll be able to learn about how to get started on your digital strategy, and you'll also be able to hear from other heritage organizations about their experiences developing um, innovative and effective digital projects. So to find out more uh, about all of this and to sign up for the webinars and events in the virtual day, you can go to the website, uh, it's heritage-digital.org. Um, the address has been just dropped into the chat there. Um, we'd also really like you to get involved with the programme. Uh, so we've got a Heritage Digital uh, closed Facebook group where you can chat with others from the sector. So if you search for Heritage Digital on Facebook, you'll find us there. Um, you can also interact on Twitter. We're using the hashtag Heritage Digital, and I will be attempting some live tweeting during the session. And we'll also send you a feedback form after the webinar. So we really hope you enjoy the session, that you find it useful. Um, and we'd also be very keen to hear your thoughts and feedback um, afterwards as well. And finally, I would like to take this opportunity just to say that we also have a brand new programme, Rebuilding Heritage, which is the programme I work on. And this is launching today. And this is a new programme which will provide training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations to respond to the challenges of COVID-19. Uh, we're launching today. You can find out more on our website. That's rebuildingheritage.org.uk. So please do come and check us out. Now, on to the session itself. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce your speaker for this session, Naomi Korn. She is the founder and managing director of Naomi Korn Associates. Uh, Naomi is one of the UK's leading experts in copyright, data protection and GDPR, and rights and licensing. 
She's been supporting the public, corporate, education and charity sectors on rights management and rights exploitation for the last 20 years. So I'd like to hand over now and welcome Nomi. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I've just checked the figures. We have 165 of us today, which is absolutely splendid. Um, so this is very exciting. And um, I should also say a big shout out to the National Lottery Heritage Fund for funding this uh, vital piece of work as part of the digital skills development program headed up by Josie Fraser. We're thrilled to be part of this initiative and it's more meaningful now than ever before. Um, so this is a topic uh, we're going to be covering today, copyright and suppliers and how you get the rights you need in digital content. Um, I'm really thrilled because we can look at this from both sides. So yes, we can look at this from the heritage sector, but also uh, Naomi Cord Associates is a supplier. And so what I've tried to do is frame for you um, a webinar today for about 40, 45 minutes is going to take you through the key issues. Now, I should say that we're not able to cover everything because it's only 45 minutes of time, but I will cover the headline issues for you. But with great excitement, I can announce that we're working on a guide right now that will break those issues down into their component parts and give you the detail you need. So watch this space. The guide that accompanies this webinar will be available sometime in October. So please go and have a look at that. And like this webinar, the guide is available for free for you to download. Now, more than that, um, both this webinar and also the guide will be available for you under a Creative Commons attribution license. And I'm also really, really proud to announce this because I know that the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Josie announced this yesterday that the outputs from National Lottery Heritage funding projects will be available um, and will be encouraged to be made available under a CCBY license. Now, this means that you can freely adapt and change the webinar contents and also the guide that will accompany it to suit your own requirements. So I really hope Hope that today is as useful for you as possible as possible and with the promise that there will be more to come so this is a team at Nemi Corn Associates but this is only part of the Heritage Digital Consortium we're super proud to be working together with the Heritage Alliance Media Trust and also Charity Digital the team at Nemi Corn includes myself Patrick Iberson and Mad Maddie Beeson um, and we do as um, Vanessa very kindly said do everything we can to support the sector in its understanding of copyright and data protection issues as it applies to um, the work that heritage organizations particularly do. Now do have a look at our website it's uh, nemicorn.com we today just relaunched our community pages which gives you more information about what we do and how we support the community but also gives you some fantastic links to some of the other work that we've been funded to do by the National Lottery Heritage Fund particularly our online security and privacy a handbook which you can download for free from our website and also from the National Lottery Heritage Fund website. So these are the key aspects we're going to be covering today. As I said, these are touching the points. We have a very short amount of time to cover rather a lot of information, but what I will do is I will introduce the topics to you. What is copyright? How that arises when you work with suppliers? How you can make the most of your new content with regards to copyright issues that might arise? How you can ensure you get the rights you need when you work with suppliers? And some also top tips when working with suppliers. Um, it's a very fulsome, some subject and in fact really interestingly when I was doing research for this webinar and I went online and had a look to see if I could find anything else that anyone else had said about working with suppliers there was very little information um, so no wonder there's so many of you today joining us on this webinar wanting to find out more about what it means so um, I wanted to give some context, and this is really important that we remember this, that um, when we work with suppliers, um, we are reliant on their expertise, their very specific expertise that helps us move our activities forward and supports the work we, that we do. And indeed, it's important to remember that many suppliers that we work with, and indeed like myself, have come from our sector. Um, and indeed, many suppliers sometimes move from being a supplier to then working back within heritage organisations. And so there is a very symbiotic relationship between heritage organisations and the suppliers that we use. We need to remember um, that the expertise and the skills that our suppliers bring with them, that's their livelihood. That's how suppliers like Naomi Corn Associates, that's how we make our money. That's how we keep ourselves going and afloat. 
Now, many of us um, will do everything we can beyond paid work in order to support the sector that we believe in, that we come from. Um, but there is also um, an inherent understanding that suppliers bring with them often pre-existing content that they've created before, the knowledge and skills that's accumulated over many, many years back into our organization. And indeed, the benefit of working with suppliers is that they often jump, like we do, from client to client, bringing all the lessons that we've learned from one client to another. So just to set that as a very important piece of context for today's webinar, and now I'm going to just take us a little bit back to look at what is copyright and how does that work, particularly when we're working with suppliers. So copyright is an exclusive right that, generally speaking, the person who created the work gets when they create an original work. And it can be a whole myriad of different types of things. It can be uh, some kind of text for an exhibition pan panel. It could be a logo for a website. It could be a multitude of different types of content. And, and I'd also like to, to sort of reference the fact that when we're talking about a work, which is the generic terminology that we use when we're talking about copyright, it can be digital, it could be analog based, it could be both born digital and also a digital surrogate the extent of copyright protection is very broad indeed. Copyright comes with it, and it, it, it is, as it says, a copyright, a right to enable copying by other people, if you own that right, it comes with it also the ability to charge a fee if someone else reproduces your work. Now, it is part of the broader family of intellectual property rights, and intellectual property rights, very briefly, covers the fruits of the human mind, for example, innovations and endeavors and creativities, new and unique things that the human, quite literally the human, the, a natural person can create. And that's a whole nother story, the relationship between AI and IP, which I would suggest that you watch our blog post to find out more about that. But copyright is part of a form of intellectual property rights, which means you can buy it and you can sell it. Um, we certainly use the term very frequently, which is assigning intellectual property rights, which means that you give your rights or you transfer your rights to someone else. Um, if you don't want to do that, an alternative to dealing with intellectual property rights is giving a license. And these will be the two terms that I will be using and returning to as we come through the webinar today. And within the guide, I explain those in a lot more detail. I'd also like to reference that copyright is defined in the piece of legislation, which is the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988 as amended and revised. I'd also like just very briefly to mention that whilst it's an exclusive right that the person who made the work like a supplier owns automatically, it is offset to a minor degree by the exceptions to copyright. And these are built into the copyright legislation to try and create a fair and balanced position between, on the one hand, rights holders' interest to control copying a work, but also the user's interest in being able to use the work for the benefits of culture and education, etc. Now that would also include the work of many heritage organisations mm -hmm. up to a point. There are certain things you can do up to a point without having to get permission. Now, this is a whole webinar, as you can imagine, in its own right. But if you do want to find out more about the exceptions to copyright, please do jump onto our website, onto the resources page, that's nermicorn.com forward slash resources. And there's more information about the exceptions to copyright. And I'll also make sure that that information is held on the Heritage Digital website as well. So you can easily have a look at that too. This is also a good opportunity to reference something that many of us forget, which are moral rights. And there is, it's a thing, it's outlined in the Copyright Designs and Patents Act, and these go hand in hand with copyright. These are the rights that the creator of a work gets, and the ability not just to be named as a creator, but also to control how the work that they've created or a copy of that work is then treated. For example, any editing or changing or bleeding of sides of images, all that type of thing requires the creator's consent. And consent is one option for how permission can be granted, but also we have something called a wavering of moral rights, which is where the creator of a work can give up 
the rights to be attributed or credited and also to control how the work is treated and so therefore as we start along our journey of understanding the relationship that we have as a heritage sector with our suppliers and how copyright and moral rights work within the context of that relationship flagging up what copyright is and very briefly how it works and also moral rights and how they work and what needs to happen is really fundamental to understanding the next steps which i will be taking you through so how might copyright arise in commission content? And this is really important that we do understand, I touched upon this, some of the areas of work that our amazing suppliers help us with. For example, photography taken by freelancers or digital comms. It could be new software we have developed for us or websites. Um, it, can be, it could be marketing material. It could be the digital comms run by media companies like Media Trust, who are one of our partners on this project. Or indeed, it could be new software that we're purchasing through the fantastic work of charity digital. We might also be looking for learning materials or artworks made by commission artists. So there's a very broad school of the types of works that our suppliers may be creating on our behalf. Now, here is the opportunity to ask you a question. Um, and it's our first of three polls where I'm going to be asking you just what you think and what you think the answer is. This is really interesting and I'll, I'll then look at some of the answers you've given and we'll also publish uh, the poll results in our new guide. So what we're going to do is going to activate the poll now for you. Um, and you'll see the poll jump up on your screen. And the poll is when you commission um, a supplier to create new content, who will automatically own the copyright? The answer is one of the answers that you are asked to complete. So we'll give you probably about 20 to 30 seconds to um, put in your response. So when you commission a supplier to create new content, who will automatically own the copyright? Is it the supplier? Is it you? Is it shared? Or is it no one? So if you'd like to put your answers in now, please. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Fascinating. Thank you very much. That's super. So I, uh, I'm going to just analyze these results on the fly for you. So 65% of you have said the supplier, 21% have said you, 12% have said it's shared and 2% have said no one. So thank you very much indeed. Well, the answer to this quiz is that simply that automatically when you commission a supplier to create new content for you, the person who will automatically own the copyright, will be the supplier so that's really important to understand that when you pay money or you even have a contract unless you say something about copyright it'll be the supplier that will automatically own the copyright and this is because of the outline of the rights of the individual and also employees rights within the copyright legislation so whilst the work produced by staff so that one mean that means that anyone that's paid that's an employee that has the status of employee the copyright in their work is owned by their employer suppliers and also volunteers automatically own the rights in what they do for an organization for a heritage organization even if money is paid and actually that status particularly of employees has been written into the legislation since 1911 um, as men manifested in the Copyright Act from that period. I should also flag up for you very usefully that we have done considerable amounts of work on the relationship of volunteers to copyright and data protection. Uh, this was funded by the Museums Development Yorkshire and is available both on their website and also on our website if you want to jump over and have a look and see what we've said about that. So we've established that the copyright in anything that a supplier does for you will be owned by a supplier, which means that they have the rights to control subsequent copying. They potentially have the rights to charge you. And also we have the issue of moral rights, how the work is treated and how they're attributed. And so through the rest of this webinar, we're going to be looking at some of the ways that you can work with your suppliers to rectify that issue. I want to give you um, our first of uh, three case studies as well, which is a small local dance company has commissioned a photographer to take photographs of its dancers um, for an agreed fee. Um, there is no discussion about copyright. 
after the dance company uses the images of its dancers online, the photographer comes forward and asks for more money on the basis that the use online was not discussed and he still owns the copyright in the images. And indeed, that's one of the many scenarios that I've encountered during my 20 years of heritage organisations paying for work to be completed, nothing mentioned about copyright, and therefore subsequently not having the ability to be able to reuse the content that they commissioned for their purposes. So, the second of our three poles, so we can start mapping out a direction of travel for us. When you work with a supplier, um, do you have an agreement in writing? So, um, if we could have the next poll, please. Thank you very much. Um, so, is the answer yes always, sometimes, never, or I don't know? Okay, so if you'd like to complete the second poll and then we'll discuss the answers and take it from there, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So let's analyze these results. So 55% of you said, yes, always you have an agreement in writing. 35% say sometimes, and 9% have said, I don't know, and 1% have said never. Um, and that's very interesting indeed, because it's absolutely crucial that when you do work with suppliers, you have an agreement in writing that clearly stipulates their roles, their responsibilities, and also outlines what your expectations are from them. Now we do have, as I mentioned very early on, a very, very close relationship with our suppliers and much of that is built on trust and we often work with suppliers for many, many years and it's very easy to get into the habit of having an agreement that's a verbal agreement. But it's absolutely fundamental that for both sides there's clarity and transparency and that we avoid misunderstandings regarding what each other's roles are, but also that we have a documented piece of evidence that can support us downstream. This is a big knowledge management issue. And indeed, I've said for many years that copyright isn't just a compliance issue. It's a big issue with regards to records management and documentation and contracts management. All the things that we need to have in place to make sure that we support our activities now, but we can also support our long term sustainability particularly in these rocky times, and particularly when we need to make sure that for the long term, we know what agreements we have in place. And so our second case study expands on the issues a little bit further, and also details why an agreement in writing is so important. So a small gallery commissions a media company to create a digital installation in its exhibition space using images, sound and music. Whilst the ownership of rights is dealt with in the contract, the clearance of any third party rights is not. Without these permissions in place, the gallery is unable to display the installation. And this is an important issue to understand. It's not just about making sure that there is clarity about who owns what rights when working with a supplier, but often when we're creating really dynamic and innovative and creative installations, or digital content that we wish to reuse, we may be using content that other people, not ourselves and not our suppliers have created. And this means there needs to be absolute clarity about who is taking responsibility for clearing those rights. And indeed an outline as well about what we expect from our suppliers. Do we want them to pay the money themselves? Do we want them to negotiate the permissions on our behalf? And also what about the follow on documentation that might arise from any successful negotiations to use third party permissions? Really and truly, if a supplier is working for us, we should have that information to hand. So the poll of all polls. Poll number three. Um, if you have an agreement in place in writing working with a supplier, does it actually deal with copyright? So similar to before, if you would like to add your answers to the online poll, your options are yes, sometimes, never, and I don't know. So if you'd like to take a few seconds to complete the final poll today, and then we'll look at the results together. Thank you.
Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed. So, again, some very interesting um, results here. 41% um, of you have said yes. 39% have said sometimes. 17% have said I don't know. And we've got 3% of you saying never. So, again, there's a good feeling here that there is copyright being dealt with um, to a certain degree, but, but really and truly when we work with suppliers, copyright should always be dealt with in a contract if content if there is being created, if there, are, if there are some kind of deliverables resulting from the work that's being commissioned. So let's look at this in another way. So we've spoken and started talking about what copyright means to us and we started looking at having rights to reuse the content that we've commissioned is absolutely fundamental but from the supplier's perspective what does that mean to them and i've mentioned the symbiotic relationship we have with our suppliers and it's important to flag up the lack of clarity about copyright does create uncertainty and also can undermine trust on both sides it's also worth pointing out, and we're going to be examining this in more detail in a little bit, that it isn't an all or nothing situation. I think that that is a misconception sometimes that you either need to own the rights or not at all. And there are some halfway houses that we can achieve, but it's fundamental to understand that the wrong approach to copyright when dealing with suppliers can be detrimental to a supplier's ability to earn a living because, as I mentioned earlier, they often come with content that they've created before. So it's about understanding how that works. Many suppliers want to quite understandably talk about the work that they're doing for you. If it's not work that they're carrying out in confidence, they want to talk about the relationship and they want to be able to promote themselves. And we do this with permission from our clients on our website. Sometimes, if we're not clear about copyright or we're taking the wrong approach, we might actually be asking for more than we need. And as a result of that, we might actually be paying more than we should be. And I would also say too, and there's again a big sort of uh, dialogue that could be had subsequent to this webinar about the relationship between suppliers and the heritage sector and sort of the potential of it being unfair if too much is being asked for. The other issue that we can also be seeing if copyright isn't dealt with properly from a supplier's perspective is the request to, as I mentioned earlier, waive moral rights, which might be seen to be unnecessarily harsh. So how can, how can we create a framework that is fair for everybody? How can we create a framework that protects our copyright whilst also taking into concern the the rights of suppliers and the fact that we do have this ongoing relationship with them how can we take into account doing what we need in order to support our forward thinking sustainability and services ahead okay so a really important additional concept to float into our conversation today is when we work with commissioned artists and in this particular case study, we have an artist who's commissioned to create a sculpture for a heritage site. The sculpture will be on temporary display, then returned to the artist. The heritage site insists that the copyright in the sculpture is transferred to them. The artist does not think that this is fair and the project is shelved. So a really good example of um, what I was speaking about before and how to make sure that we think about getting the right rights that we need in order to support our projects and also work effectively with our suppliers. So here is at the beginnings of a framework for you. As I said, I'll be expanding on this in more detail in the guide that will be available later on in October. So it's absolutely vital that copyright is dealt with before you commission new works and thinking about what is it you're creating, what rights you need. If you're being funded by um, a funding body like the National Lottery Heritage Fund, you will need to throw into the mix the onward license that you've promise them so now it's the creative commons attribution license you need to understand that you will need enough rights from anyone you commission in order to make that content available under a ccby license think about these rights before you start a project and build them into your procurement procurement processes so this would be being clear and transparent about what you need so that suppliers that you do decide to go with or that do respond to any tendering activities you have know what's expected of them from the start it's again not about leaving copyright to the end because perhaps it feels too difficult and too uncomfortable for you and then 
not having those upfront conversations with your, your suppliers so they know what to expect. Making sure that your uh, comms with potential suppliers are clear about the rights you need and taking the time to discuss and explain to them what it is and why. So deciding that, okay, either if you need a transfer of copyright or you want to seek a license, permission to use what they have created for you, why you need that, what it might look like. Secure permission in writing, gentlemen's agreements, um, sound great and you know again it's, it's all about the trust we have with our suppliers but we really do need to professionalize our sector and make sure that we know and our suppliers know exactly what the status is of content that they are creating for us and of course copyright isn't the only issue that should go into some kind of agreement we also have increased obligations for example under the new data protection legislation the dreaded gdpr that came in in may 2018 we need to make sure that those are clearly outlined together with other responsibilities like confidentiality in a contract we have with a supplier make sure you take the opportunity to cover other ways that you can protect your content such as crediting and also use of a logo so again this works in both ways it's important to understand when we work with suppliers there is great enthusiasm to uh, publicize relationships but both of you may have your reasons why your logo may not be used on each other's website so it's about setting clear parameters for that use and also having discussions about fair and equitable crediting and ultimately, make sure, as I said earlier, that when you are commissioning a supplier, an important component of the framework for protecting your copyright is covering the uses of your content that you have commissioned, that is being created on your behalf. So what is the benefits of protecting copyright? Well, absolutely, it means that you can use your digital content as and when you need it to support whether it's your public access activities or indeed some of you will be looking at using uh, commission content commission digital content to support your long-term sustainabilities including underpinning some of your um, business activities the benefits of protecting copyright and being clear about what you each own and what you can do with each other's um, logos and crediting for example being clear about the clearance of third party rights means that infringements can be avoided both in terms of your suppliers rights but also third party rights and again because it's so important um, as we move forward as a sector to understand that getting the rights you need in a contract and dealing with copyright at that point and also being clear up front with your suppliers about what you need can also provide us with a good opportunity to look towards our resilience now and in the future. So the big question, what do you put into a contract? So again, I've explained this in more detail um, in the guide, but crucially, it's about understanding whether you want a transfer and assignment of copyright to you in commission content or indeed a license back. And there are lots of different flavors of this. So let's take the transfer of copyright first. A transfer of copyright from a supplier to you must be in writing. It can be electronic, it could be by email, although I would strongly suggest that a contract is more fulsome than an email, um, particularly if the value of the contract is higher, there may well be other, other aspects that you would need to include. And I will also uh, very uh, quickly reference the force majeure clauses um, that many of you uh, would have seen in your contracts, perhaps never really quite understood what those meant, but they basically, those clauses mean that with an act of God, there is some kind of impact on the agreement between you and your supplier. And of course, COVID is a good example where many of us have been re-examining our force majeure clauses to find out exactly what each other's responsibilities are. So again, just to reiterate, having the agreement in writing is fundamental. A transfer of copyright means that the supplier that you're commissioning is giving you, is assigning you the copyright in what they've created for you, for you to then use that content for whatever you want without having to go back to them. Now, it's not all or nothing. And really interestingly, in my experience, when I've been working um, across the sector and with suppliers, and indeed, um, you know, counting us as suppliers as well, many suppliers don't want to give their copyright and um, push back when a heritage organization asks for this as part of the contract negotiation, if indeed that's a subject that's actually dealt with properly. 
Now, what I always advise um, my clients and heritage organizations that we work with isn't just to worry and try and negotiate from that position into something else or nothing is actually to ask the question why why don't you want to transfer a copyright and often what i hear back when i ask that question is that the supplier it's not that the supplier doesn't want to want to support the, the heritage sector indeed it's the opposite many suppliers want the heritage sector to flourish to do as well as they can and to be able to use what they have paid for it's just that the supplier wants to be able to use what they have done perhaps to support their promotional activities and so one of the ways around the kind of seemingly so shut down of an assignment is for a heritage organization to ask for an assignment of copyright with a non-exclusive license back granted to the supplier so that the supplier can then use that content to support the non-commercial activities like promotional work. Now, of course, this depends on what you are commissioning. It depends on how confidential the material is. It depends on how much in-house it is. It depends on how valuable it is. And we saw earlier in the webinar that there are lots of different ways we work with supplies. There's no one rule fits all, but certainly that gives some kind of scope for movement and, and breaking perhaps any kind of stalemate that's been achieved. The second option, um, instead of an assignment to copyright, is an exclusive license. So in this particular instance, the supplier owns the copyright um, but grants back an exclusive license to the heritage organization for whom they're working to be able to use the content in the ways that they want. Now exclusive license means that the supplier cannot grant the same license back to anybody else and indeed uh, will also prevent them from using that content in the same way themselves. So an exclusive license can almost be as good as an assignment of copyright if framed in the right way. The second option is a non-exclusive license that could be granted to um, the heritage organization. A non-exclusive license is less valuable than the other two. Arguably, it should be cheaper, therefore, than the other two as well. And it means that the um, heritage organization can use the work in the ways they want, as can anybody else. And so here, there is a really interesting relationship between the value, as I said, of the, con of the content that's been commissioned, how confidential it is, um, how much you all need to use it, the longevity of the content. So again, there's lots of shades of gray here. An assignment could be for a certain period of time even, or for certain territories and then revert back to the supplier if the heritage organization no longer needs it. And I think this is a really important part of negotiation with suppliers that we really haven't dealt with very well as a, as a sector, understanding that there are variants. Now, the one thing you'll see that's not on there is shared copyright. And I have to say that I always find um, that whilst that sounds very equitable and fair, shared copyright can be more complicated because it means that actually you each have to ask each other's permission continually to be able to use each other's work. So that can be administratively more cumbersome. And actually I, should, I would say that it should either be one party or another who should be owning the copyright. I would also say too that I'd like to throw into the mix working with commissioned artists and the case study that I flicked up on the screen earlier. And in my experience, if a heritage organization is commissioning an artist to create a work that perhaps isn't then uh, simulated or acquired by the heritage organization into their collections, it's often fairer for the, the heritage organization who's commissioning the artist to ask either for an exclusive license or a non-exclusive license rather than an assignment of rights. If that artist is then taking that artwork that's been commissioned back, it feels to me very unfair. So you can see here, and I, I've talked a lot about this relationship between copyright and ethics, very unfair to ask for um, an assignment of copyright and indeed more than that may be a reason as the case study demonstrated that the commission may not go ahead because the artist might push back entirely but again i hope that i've given you a lot of sort of flex or outlined some flex with regards to contractual clauses dealing with moral rights as well um, with regards to what to put into a contract is also important and understanding that yes there is the option to ask the supplier to waive their moral rights to give up their rights to be credited or to control how a work is used the alternative which i often uh, suggest to our clients is 
the option of going down a consent route where consent is requested and then of course the consent can be consent for example to be attributed or credited where reasonably practical or um, consent to change or alter a work um, and then the, perhaps a heritage organisation to um, give reassurances because this is important that the work would be treated sensitively. And finally, there is an, also, I think, in the contract, an intrinsic need to, to outline how each of you will credit each other. What should go into a contract, second part, is third party rights. And it's about understanding who clears any third party rights, making sure that there is budget and making sure that you understand, perhaps each party understands um, and agrees to the amount that could be could be paid and who negotiates what's right what rights and finally about um, providing documentation if such rights are cleared so uh, one of our clients um, produced very recently a sound and light show which was a beautiful um, piece of digital installation a bit like the case study where they had used third party content as part of that so they had used content that um, the heritage organization owned the rights to they had brought new content with them um, but they also used content that they had sourced from commercial picture libraries like getty and alame and bridgman art library and it was very clearly outlined within the contract that the supplier would take responsibility for clearing the third party rights the time scale was discussed the budget was agreed and then at the end of the project the supplier provided the heritage organization with the documentation where the permissions were outlined and then the heritage organization could take those permissions and document and record them back into its digital asset management system so in the long term it could understand what it could do with that content and it provided the best possible way of protecting its copyright and providing the opportunity for them to be able to reuse that very important and very valuable piece of work that the supplier produced for them so as I said, this is a really high level overview of the issues and there's lots more detail in the guide that will be produced by Heritage Digital later on, in, later on in October. But what are some top tips from me to you where we are right now? So crucially, think about what you need. What are the rights you need before you commission the work? OK, sort them out. Think about what your funders are requesting. OK, we mentioned the CCBY license from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, for example. Think about what you need. Do you need commercial rights? Do you want to use something just for a short period of time? How valuable is it to you? Is it in-house that you're using it? Think about that. Think about what you need. And also, if you don't need a transfer of copyright, that may save you money because you may be able to negotiate a lesser price. Think about whether your supplier is bringing with them content that they've done uh, for other people and you can also think about how you might stipulate and split that out in your contract and we're going to be talking again about that in the guide decide whether you need a transfer of copyright therefore or whether a license is license is enough is is suits your needs now and also in the future um, think about whether you need a combination so i reference an assignment of copyright also with a license back Make sure you manage expectations with your suppliers as early as possible so that everyone knows what's expected and they can also discuss with you if there are any problems and you can have a proper space to discuss it and negotiate the rights. Always be respectful um, and find something that's mutually agreeable and nearly always there is a mutually agreeable solution. People want this to work. Our suppliers want to work with the heritage sector. And so how can you make it work for both of you? Now, of course, you are paying the money to carry out to work for you. So there is a certain give and take here, but there's a long way that you can go in your discussions. Be clear about third party rights. So what's the content that you're bringing in? What else are you using? OK, outline that at the beginning and think about budgets and build that into your project management, into your budget management as well. Please don't forget more rights in your agreements. Make sure you're clear about them. Make sure you decide whether you need a waiver of more rights. And I would say, for example, if something is client confidential, if it's a report, an internal report, or even a very, very high value piece of content like a new website or a new logo, then yes, a waiver of more rights is entirely appropriate. But there may be other types of uses where it might be uh, moral rights are dealt with on a consent basis. And finally, always get an agreement in writing before you start and make sure that that agreement in writing is wherever possible 
encompassed within your records management policies and give a copy to your arch archivist if that's what you need to do, but make sure that you have a record in perpetuity of that agreement. So we're coming to the end of this um, presentation and I wanted to give you plenty of time for questions. Um, but if you want to find out more immediately, um, the Intellectual Property Office website has lots of information about copyright, trademarks and other types of intellectual property rights. There has been some really splendid work carried out by the Association of Cultural Enterprise, which has been funded by Arts Council England, and they have um, produced some work on contracts. And also there's a really important article about the fourth majeure clause and its relationship to COVID. So it's a related theme, as I've mentioned. Do check us out on our website. Um, there's lots of activity on there. We have a newsletter which we will be relaunching this month with much more news than ever before. And you can subscribe for free to our newsletter, which is available under a Creative Commons license. And also jump on and have a look at our news items about once every two weeks. Please have a look at the digital, um, the, the uh, Heritage Digital website and um, the information that's contained there. It's being updated all the time. The guide will be on there as well as the brilliant guides that have, we've already created and information about our really important event at the beginning of October that Vanessa mentioned to you. So I hope that you found this webinar interesting. Um, it's giving you some food for thought and some tips and some sensible advice for working with suppliers when dealing with copyright. Um, I'd really like to invite you to um, put some questions in the Q&A box that we'll pick up on and to pass over to Vanessa, who um, has been um, busily documenting the questions that you have been putting down for me. So thank you all very much indeed for listening to me and the webinar today. Thank you, Naomi. That was really, really fascinating, really informative. Uh, there was a lot of detail in there, um, lots of practical tips and advice. Um, so we'll go now to the questions and just having a look at what's been coming into the Q&A box. There are a couple of themes emerging. So there's, there's sort of a theme around um, that, that sort of thorny question of actually, do I really need an agreement? And then there's another one sort of theme looking at other types of staff members who are perhaps not um, traditionally involved with the commissioning process. But we'll start with the first um, questions around agreements. So I'm just gonna go for one from the top here. So this is, uh, we commission lots of content from suppliers, but it tends to be people that we want to support. And so we feel like using contracts may go against our charitable aims. Um, would you agree this is a good reason, a valid reason not to have something in writing? Um, I, um... I think that, again, as I said, that, you know, we do have those wonderful relationships with our suppliers and we work a lot on trust, but, but in the long term, it's about clarity for both sides and making sure that all the T's have been crossed and the I's um, have been dotted to make sure that we have the paperwork to support what's going on. It's not just about transparency, but it's also about clarity and it's about protecting our interests and protecting our suppliers' interests and we can do neither if it's a verbal agreement. So having an agreement in writing is fundamental from that perspective. But if there is any type of transfer of copyright, that must be done in writing. And I would argue as well that although you can have a verbal verbal permission, it's so it can be so ambiguous and so unclear that downstream it can cause problems for us if we don't understand or we don't remember what we have agreed. So putting agreements in writing is fundamental and even more so today when we need to make sure that there are other fundamental issues that we're dealing with when we're working with suppliers, particularly if they're on site. That's great, thank you. Um, just as a, as a follow up to that one, so we've had a couple of people ask that, um, how does this apply to, to volunteers? So if volunteers are creating content for your organisation, should you also be, be looking to get something in writing there as well? Okay, so the answer is yes. Um, as I mentioned, we were commissioned by Museums Development Yorkshire to produce a whole suite of resources, including fact sheets and Q&As on working with volunteers, covering both copyright and data protection issues. Because under the status of the law, anything that a volunteer creates for a heritage organisation, it's the volunteer that will own the copyright. 
if we as heritage organisations want to be able to reuse freely what they've created, whether it's through a transfer of copyright, an assignment, or indeed a licence, we must get this in writing. Now, under English and Welsh law, it would be through a deed of copyright assignment, and there is a template online, or indeed you get a licence via a deed. Um, but under Scottish law, an assignment in Scottish law is called an assignation, um, we don't need that. There isn't a need to have the same vehicle. It doesn't have to be a deed per se. It can just be um, a general copyright um, transfer agreement that can be used, but that's fundamental. So there was actually a very interesting uh, Twitter uh, debate that I was party to a few months ago, looking at the pros and cons of getting an assignment from volunteers and also looking at the other option of getting a license. So it's, it's about one or the other, making sure there's a heritage organization in order to have the rights that we need both now and in the future, we need those agreements in writing. Thank you. So I think that I mean, that's really clear that it's absolutely fundamental. And um, as we've already mentioned several times, when the, the downloadable guide comes out, all of the options um, for you will be included in that guide. Um, so let's move on to another question. Uh, so we're, we're talking on this programme specifically about um, digital. And so we've got a question here that asks, when I'm commissioning new content digitally, is there anything I need to be aware of that wouldn't be the case when I'm commissioning new content for a physical space, for a physical space, sorry, for um, a piece of sculpture, for example? Um, no, I mean it's the same digital um, digital content, which is why I sort of the you know I, I was I jump between the two. The way the copyright works would also work in the same way with um, digital content that's been commissioned as well as ordinary content or analog based content. Um, I think that the, the other kind of issue to throw into the mix, which I haven't mentioned, is the relationship between heritage organisations and perhaps already existing digital content such as streams from social media platforms. And there there's an even more sort of slightly more complicated environment in which we're operating because it's not just about the status of the copyright work. Um, in terms of the person who created it, it's also about understanding the terms and conditions of that platform from which you are getting the content. Um, we have produced a fact sheet that's known as Associates on social media and understanding that. Um, and I think there's also another issue as well, which is about user generated content and making sure that if it's user generated content that um, is so perhaps flowing through your heritage organisations by virtue of a web-based platform, understanding that the copyright issues are still the same, that the person who created the work will have the rights and you need to make sure if you as a heritage organisation are wanting to reuse it, you have terms and conditions that clearly outline um, your perhaps a license, a license back to you to be able to freely use that content. And similarly, as I mentioned before, third party rights, making sure that they are dealt with and ideally, if it's user generated content, it would be the person who's uploading the content themselves taking responsibility for clearing any third party rights that go up on that platform. So there's lots of lots to unpick here. But in essence, no, it doesn't make a difference. Um, the principles are still the same to remember. And so just to very quickly look at um, a question on that, that similar idea of looking at digital platforms. If people have shared uh, images on your perhaps Twitter or Facebook um, platforms, do you are you able to reshare those? And how how does the copyright on those images work? Well, it's okay. So when you um, go on to one, jump onto these platforms with Twitter or Instagram, um, you as a person uploading the content. Um, are making a contractual agreement with the platform provider, i.e. Twitter, Instagram or whatever, that either you are the rights holder in that content or you have permission from any third party rights holders in order to post that content. So you as a person uploading it have responsibility. Now it's very difficult if you are someone who's wanting to reshare a tweet to sometimes know whether that person who's put that stuff up um, has actually had permission. But so I, I'd say I do, I, I do recognize the reality that really, you know, we, it can be complicated um, but the responsibility ultimately is the person who has uploaded that content on the site to, to make sure that they actually have the permissions that they need in order to do so so heritage organizations should only be uploading content that they specifically have permission to be able to then retweet and make available okay thank you i've just looked at the time we've got five minutes left so we'll just see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions Brilliant. Um, so right from the top here, uh, we've got someone asking about um, 
content sort of at sort of preparing yourself as staff members if you're um, doing things that might have copyright implications so they said as a conservator I photographically document um, work the work process as I complete it and then they've asked um, about the potential for those um, images to be used publicly so what are the actions to that, sh that they should be taking um, to ensure they're doing the right thing whilst they're they're doing their work okay so if um if the um, works that have been conserved have been created either by living creators or by um, creators who died less than 70 years ago, it, if those um, images, um, you wish those images to be made available to the public, it's about liaising with the creator and or their rights holders to make sure that you have the permission to do so before you make them publicly available. So it's about getting permission in writing. Now, um, if you do require a basic permissions form, um, we have produced one on the Naomi Corn Associates website, which is also now available, um, I'm very pleased to say, on the Heritage Digital website, which can be used as a template to get the permissions that you need. Um, there are two options. There's either a transfer of copyright um, or indeed a license. So I'd suggest that you have a look at that form. It's available under a Creative Commons license, so you can bespoke it and make it as useful as possible for your own organisation. So to get the, the, ne the necessary rights holders to agree to that. Um, there's also a very interesting, I think, uh, relationship between conservators and living artists. And in my experience, particularly working for contemporary organisations, um, sometimes a conservator can... Um, actually uh, hit the issue of moral rights. And I remember giving a lecture on this some years ago where it's actually really fundamental to work with the living artist hand in hand to make sure that the work is conserved in a way that they wanted it to be conserved, particularly some of the artworks that themselves may be more, um, maybe less static and may by the very nature of the work have an, have an aspect of change about them. And that, that very much hits on the relationship of um, working with living artists and moral rights because of the moral rights component, ensuring that the creative work can, can, has the say in how that work is then treated or reproduced. So I hope that gives some, some, some kind, of, um, kind of overview of the complexity, particularly from a conservator's perspective. Great, um, and for our final one, so, uh, I can see that there's a, suddenly a lot of questions, um, extra questions popping up, but I'd like to take okay. this one because uh, on subcontractors, because mostly we've been talking about working directly with suppliers, but there's a question here that says, I'd like to ask what advice you have for working with subcontractors. For example, if you've got one main AV supplier who's subcontracting specialist work, such as music composition, uh, should you have a direct copyright licensing agreement with each individual subcontractor or would you have one agreement with the main contractor and rely on them to negotiate appropriate agreements with their subcontractors? Perfect that's great okay now that's a lovely question thank you very much indeed and all these questions have been great thank you so um, I'll give you an example because that's actually how we work so we've got about 25 consultants who work as part of the team at Nemicon Associates who all have um, a contract with Nemicon Associates and so when we're brought in by a client to do work on behalf of a client we've already got the agreement in with our um, subcontractors that um, what they do, um, the copyright in what they do is transferred to us that, so that we can then transfer it to the client if necessary and that they take responsibility, for example, for confidentiality and data protection responsibilities that we also have. So we, we kind of take that role. So as a contractor, if you have subcontractors, the easiest thing for your clients is if you as a main contractor have those agreements to with your subcontractors um, and then your client is only contracting with you it's, it's less cumbersome less problematic less complicated downstream um, you will also probably see in some of the contracts you might have with the heritage heritage organizations with the sort of clients i guess um, that um, they may themselves or you as a heritage organization may want to make sure that when you're subcontracting or when you're contracting work and you know that their subcontractors put the onus of responsibility on your main contractor to have the necessary agreements in with the subcontractors so that by far is the easiest way and I think the most transparent way to operate as well and then you know everyone has signed what they need to sign and agreed to what they need to agree to thank you um, 
Right, so we're, we're now at 12 o'clock, so I think we'd better stop there. Uh, thank you everyone for really great questions. Um, obviously we've not been able to cover everything, but we do have a record of these questions so that we can use them to help us finalise the guide that will be available. And um, we're also uh, going to answer some of them on Twitter. So Naomi's very uh, kindly offered to be available on Twitter over the course of the coming weeks just to pick up on some of those um, additional questions. So if you'd like to follow the discussion, um, please head over and you can find uh, Naomi Korn it's at N-K-O-R-N, -N, so at N Korn on Twitter. Um, so I think that's it from us for today. Um, really hope that you found today's uh, session useful. Um, it's been really brilliant to have you here, Naomi, so thank you so much for your time. Um, and we'd like to ask everyone, um, as I mentioned, to give us some feedback on the session afterwards. We will email you a feedback form and we would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you thought because it will help us to plan our future events. Um, and just lastly, uh, I'd like to mention again those two web addresses that you need. So uh, that's heritage-digital.org for all of the Heritage Digital resources. And we'd also love you to come along to rebuildingheritage.org.uk to um, check out our new programme. As I mentioned, we are launching today. We're taking over uh, this month's Heritage Chat, which is happening today. Uh, so today at 1pm, um, please head over to Twitter to join us and I really hope to see you there. So thank you once again for joining us. Thank you to Naomi for the really useful session and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Bye everyone.